So thank you all for coming. Um, read and write considered harmful. Why? Why this talk? I usually start with this question, which is, why am I standing up here and, and saying anything about this one? Well, I've been doing some design work recently, uh, and there have been a lot of ideas coming into my mind that I've been trying to communicate to my colleagues, and I've sort of kind of failed in certain cases, or said, well, there's, there's something I can see here that they haven't seen, um, or I'm making, am I just making fuss about stuff, or why would I do things in certain ways? Um, I've done a lot of stuff recently that's involved REST APIs, which everybody thinks are great, and I'm going, they're not quite as good as you might think for certain reasons. And I think that, that they have been looking at too low a level. They've been looking at a sort of development level is, yeah, we can just push data around, uh, but I think there are some bigger issues around that one, and if you get stuck at that level, there's some quite big things that you miss, uh, and actually it can harm your systems. And so that's what this talk is about. So I've got a few things to talk about here. Um, we can start with read and write, because we all know what that is. But actually, have we thought about the implications? They're not symmetric. Read and write are not at all the same thing. There's quite big differences between them that we need to try and understand. Um, doing architecture work, I have to think about <laughs> business processes and rules and schemas and other things like that, and data validity. How does that fit into this picture with reads and writes? Um, Quite a, a bit about performance and scalability and concurrency issues. And then there's a chunk uh, in the middle, which is six questions that I use to think about data and the way that I access data and what the implications are about, about uh, that. Um, the subtle use of asynchrony in systems, because a lot of people just build synchronous systems. We want to see what the implications of asynchrony are about that one. There are some issues around about changing of structures as well, that data doesn't always have the same form. And we have to look at that one and state management at the end, which is how do you manage state across a system? What does that actually mean and what are the implications for that? Read. It's all pretty straightforward. You say, can I have that thing, please? And you get it. So we all know about this. Um, the nice thing is that we can cache these. I mean, cache these at multiple levels, and most of the time, we don't need to worry about that one. When you use your laptop, uh, you don't really think about there's an L1 cache, an L2 cache, an L3 cache, and main memory, and then there may be some disk or virtual memory, et cetera. Most people don't think about that one. Some developers don't think about it either. Um, <laughs> so it is, um, it's transparent, mostly, which is, which is nice. Um, it is usually idempotent. So idempotence is a, is a property which says, well, I can read this again, uh, and if I do the thing once or more than once, it's the same as doing this once. Turn on the light bulb is idempotent. So you turn it on, and if you turn it on again, it's still on. That's not always the case. Uh, but with reads, it usually is. Um, in fact, things like HTTP has specified that certain things should be idempotent. You can partition things. And we'll see when we come to scaling this one. You can say, yeah, OK, I can do that one. That's easy enough. I can go there for this and go there for that. You can have, um, you have the yellow pages has got A, B, C, D, et cetera. You know where things are. You split that one up nice and easily. It's very straightforward. You have some rules about security, but they're mostly about access control rules. Who can see what? Very important, obviously. But there are, that's just one side of things. Uh, you don't need to worry about updates. They're usually synchronous, and they're usually blocking calls. You want to read something, you've got to wait for the answer, usually. Um, but you also scale your bandwidth. If you notice what's happening here, you've got X, and you have caches like that, and it just fans out, that picture at the top. It gets, we get more, and that's why caches work. Things like uh, content distribution networks, CDNs, CloudFront for Amazon, uh, and things like that. That works because it scales it out, and that's for reads. So that's, that's kind of what reads do. Obviously, we don't have writes which are horrible in comparison. Because as you can see, we're all trying to write the same thing. We have got a contention generator. We're bashing into the same place. It, and so caching doesn't work kind of so well here. And if you have a cache, you have to decide, are you going to have a write-back cache or a write-through cache? Or what's my eviction policy? Or how big is this going to be? And then well, how do I keep multiple caches coherent? So your L1, L2, L3 caches, how do you keep those co coherent when it comes to a write? Hmm. How do I scale my writes? Uh, because this fan-in is creating contention. 
we're all trying to go into one place. So the difference between read and between write, if the fire alarm went off here, we'd all try and do a write through that door. Bang, big contention, and then we get the other side of it, and guess what? We have a nice big fan out. Yeah, so f we're trying to jam our way in with writes, but with reads, we can fan it out. So they're really quite different in the way they behave. If you do partition things, you end up sharding this one. Well, that works if it's, if it's a just kind of a vertical shard. Because you go, well, I can write that one thing, but if I need to write here and here and here, this gets to be awkward quite quickly. And you have lots of other problems to deal with. Access control is now not just read, but it's also about modification rules. Who's allowed to update something? There's quite a lot of business processes <laughs> that have to, uh, that rely upon the change uh, of things and modifying. Who can change your website? However, with these ones, we may be able to delay them. We may be able to do this asynchronously, which is a write-back cache, for instance. We'll write back to a cache, not immediately, but it may appear like it has done, and, but it may not have actually done it yet. And idempotence is something that you choose. Reads normally give you that for free. You don't normally have to think about it. Um, but uh, with write, you have to choose that. So that's just the basics of read and write. And immediately, we see that there's a, a kind of a big difference and divergence between these ones. We get some dependencies. As soon as we start reading and writing things, we start moving data around. Um, and even simple code has dependencies. And say, well, where does this come from? Where does it go? And it's asymmetric. Because the object that's being called, in this case, uh, x, doesn't know where it's been called from. Whereas it knows about its outbound. So it knows where to write, and so it's got that knowledge of where it's going, but it doesn't know, have knowledge of where it's coming from. So this is te uh, testing difficulties. We get all the problems of having to substitute things and mocks and all those other things. But that's normally on the output, not on the input. It also introduces the notion of pushing and pulling, which is like um, this diagram here is a uh, thing saying input, is it pushing data into x? Is x pulling data from that? You can sort of kind of work this one out because it says input and output, and it's in fact pushing both. But that's just as a human, you can see that. But there's nothing that you can see other than on the arrows that tells you that. We'll come back to this subject in a while. So I said that um, I'd done quite a bit of work recently with people using REST APIs. Well, REST. REST is representational state transfer. It's move data from here to here. That's what Fielding's thesis was all about, which is moving data from one place to another. So essentially, we have just moved. We have just gone to a getters and setters pattern. On steroids, we have an in industrial scale anti-pattern. In some ways, it's the worst possible thing. We've separated code and data. Now, we're good OO programmers. We like to have these things together. We go, yeah, I've got some data, I've got some rules, et cetera, and it's all in one place. I can test it. What have we just done? We have completely blown that out because now we need to have the rules in every client. And if one of them gets it wrong, we're in trouble. Grep is your friend. There are rules such as about data. I have a stock level here. The number of items on the shelf. If it gets to be minus one, a physical impossibility, where is the problem? There's no obvious answer to where the problem is. You've got to start going through and debugging, et cetera, because you're just moving data around. It doesn't, there's, there's nothing here to help you. This is, to me, is a big anti-pattern. So if we say, like, now we've got some rules. What are we going to do about rules? Well, OK, and those could have been, I didn't label here whether it was read or the write, but Let's see about read and write. And we've got a choice. In certain cases, we can say, right, we're going to have the schema, all the rules and everything else on the right side. So we're writing our data, and we're checking that the client writes things correctly. Now, to me, that's a, a nice way of doing it. You never allow bad data or invalid data into your system. Stop it straight off. You know, get rid of all that rubbish. Do the validation. Say, I'm not going to accept that, that data, whatever you do at that point. And that is typically how you enforce input data and you have nice, shiny uh, data Well, to, to the best you can uh, evaluate it there in your box. Now, there's also the other option, which is to do, well, I'll write anything, but they'll work out what it is when I read it. And this is typically what no SQL people do. Yeah, we haven't got schemas. We don't need that. Just write some JSON, and we'll work it out when we get there. Ah, this is a choice. Which do you want? Do you want to enforce valid data, but then say, I can't 
now deal with schema migration because I've now got to have what happens when I have a change. I add, need to add an extra column. What happens to all the data that's already there? Well, maybe I can say, well, I'll allow you to write that here, but I'll know when I pick it up that it's a version one or a version two and it's got this extra field or not. Hmm, this, this starts to look a little bit more complex than just, yeah, we can just read and write data. Another option is, yeah, we'll put this in here, we'll put it in the schema. We'll put the schema inside with the data. We're kind of doing the OO view of the world, and that's typically how your SQL database does it. It says, look, here's the schema, here's the columns. If you don't write that, then we're done. Um, get out of here. So we have these things to worry about. Migration, version, co uh, code and rule duplication. So the other thing about uh, REST, uh, REST is just CRUD. It's, it's, we've got create, read, update, delete. Now, let's look at the state chart. So on the top, on the left there, we have a state chart for an entity in, uh, in um, REST. Create, read, update, delete. That's it. That's its state, which is you've written something or you create it, you can read it, you can update it, or you can delete the object. That's it. Real business processes don't look like a single box. Not the ones I have to deal with anyway. The ones I have to deal with, and probably the ones you do as well, have much, many, much more in the way of state. We have business processes and states. So that thing at the bottom there doesn't look anything like the thing at the top there. And if you're trying to use REST, you're trying to sort of kind of jam that state machine or state chart into that thing at the top. You're trying to work out after the fact going, can I do this transition or not? Well, it's not obvious at all from the data or from what's going on, because you've kind of hidden that. You've just turned it into read and write. But you've got rid of process. You've got rid of the fact you have multiple states. You've got rid of all these other things about uh, sub-entities. How do you model that one? Well, you can model it at the top and say have order, and then they have lots of bits inside. That's one way of doing this one. But that introduces lots of other things about aggregates and, and uh, partial updates and transactional boundaries that we have to look at. Alternatively, you can map each one of these as separate. These are design decisions, but it's a bit more than just read or write. So let's move on to uh, having given REST a good kicking. I'll come back to it, don't worry. It's not going to get up. I want to talk about scaling. Um, so I've been working on some things where people have uh, had problems. There's uh, one, um, one person I've been speaking to. I've known him for a number of years, and he's moved a CTO from company to company to company. And every company he's been to has had the same problem. He has inherited a legacy system with a big central database, and he spent his time trying to scale it. And then he manages somehow to scale that one. Then he moves into another company and finds exactly the same problem. And his company has been growing five times every year, because it's in the gaming industry. It's like going up like this, and he has some serious scalability problems. And so I see this pattern. And this is a scaling pattern that I see happening again and again. You start off at the top. You say, the application is too slow. So you just go and get some more web servers on the front and start beating this one up. Yay, we managed to get our demand. Phew, we've managed to buy ourselves three months of time before the load gets up to another level. Then you go, uh, OK, right, now we get to the second one. Is that the database is starting to creak a bit. Maybe we should get a, big data, get a bigger database. So they move up to the next size of database in Amazon. Um, and they do that, so there's a factor of two. Um, and then eventually they run out of box. Remember I said all the rights we had this contention is like you were coming into this thing in the middle. What we have created there with a database is a right contention generating thing. It's also the biggest global variable I've ever seen. It's like a terabyte global variable. And we kind of know that that's not a good idea on the whole. But anyway, we, we, we carried on doing that. We scaled our read and our write. But at this point, we've run out of, out of box. And this is where the fun really gets to start, because you go, OK, well, maybe we can scale the reads, because we've got more than reads than writes. So you start getting replication and MySQL slaves and all those other kind of things. And so you have to read from one and write back to the master. And you've bought yourself another six months, maybe, because you can kind of get away with this one, but the operational nightmare is a bit horrible. So you scale the read bandwidth. And then six months later, you go, OK, we've now got a problem. Now we need to scale the write bandwidth. And this is where it gets a lot of fun, because now you have to start sharding this one. You have to start partitioning your database. And this gets, this gets capital. This is, this is fun with, with, uh, with capitals, definitely. 
And then eventually you come to the conclusion that actually best thing to do is instead of trying to have one big database in the middle, should we just do this with sort of kind of microservices or that kind of stuff and have them separate components so that we're not trying to jam everything like this into one. We split things up so that we've got the ability to scale things individually. Wouldn't that be a good idea? Why don't we start here anyway and avoid that pain path? It's up to you. Maybe you like pain. So partitioning and sharding work to some extent. They work well, or more easily, if you have a strong bias around a primary key. If you don't have a, a main primary key where you can do that one, and in certain cases, and I'll show you cases where this doesn't work, um, it's hard to do. So it's nasty if you have to go cross-partition. What happens if you need to update things in multiple places? That gets to be ugly quite quickly. Um, Particularly for write, which is not idempotent, you now need cross-box transactions uh, and all those other kind of things. So if you're into XA transactions and all those other things, or an ESB in the front of it that I've seen recently where you're trying to synchronize all these things, that's, that's a, plain, uh, a place you don't want to go to. There's also a nasty one I'll come back to, which is uh, partial failure on write. There's a, a classic paper by uh, Keith Waldo, uh, who was at Sun, on the differences in distributed systems to in-memory programming. So in-memory programming and distributed systems are different. There's differences in latency. Partial uh, failure on write is one of the issues. Uh, the other one is it introduces concurrency that you didn't have before. So you may have a single threaded thing in memory. As soon as you go cross box, you're now in a concurrent environment, which means you do read, modify, write, etc. You have all sorts of windows. I told you this gets painful quite quickly. What, what I suggest instead your services, back to these services like this, <coughs> let's see if we can make our services, the boundaries of those, align with my operation boundaries um, and align with my failure boundaries. So basically, I've got a service that says the transaction is, has all the data here in one place, I didn't, don't need to go anywhere else, and I don't have to deal with cross-boundary stuff. That's definitely worth looking at. Another thing about REST, REST gives you one item at a time. What happens when you want multiple items? And I've seen this one uh, in happen uh, really badly. There's the n plus one access problem. We'll come back to that uh, a little bit later. What happens when I want multiple objects? Well, I have to go and fetch them one at a time. That's not very fast. Even if you try to do them in parallel, it's just a lot of mess. Um, I've seen all sorts of problems with uh, object relational mapping, and I'll give you an example a little bit later on. So how do you avoid some of these problems? Avoid shared mutable data. It is the evil of all computing. Do not go there. This is uh, what Kevin Henney referred to as the synchronization quadrant. Um, immutable data. If you can have immutable data and it's const, it, which is your friend, you can share everything. Don't worry about it. Fine, it doesn't change. That's really nice. If you're not sharing data, you can change it. That's great. If you're sharing it and changing it, you have a big problem. Contention. Do not go here. Avoid this if you can. The rest of that one is easy. This is the nasty bit. <coughs> Please don't avoid that. Now, shared rights. Shared rights are not only nasty, but they don't scale. If, you are, uh, this, if you're doing in-memory programming, uh, then shared rights don't scale. This is the most important graph in concurrency for in-memory programming. So this is a graph from uh, Dmitry Vikov, uh, but you can uh, see it in lots of uh, other places as well. So I've got along the bottom here, this is logarithmic scale, so it could be linear, doesn't particularly matter. And those two lines going up there, the orange and the blue line, this is private read and um, shared read. So what do I mean by that? So shared read is everybody reading the same, multiple threads reading the same item. Great, it scales. Fantastic, you get everything in the same caches, we're good. If you're all reading the same item, it's fine. It scales nicely. We have private write, which is the yellow line, which says, okay, we can all write things, we're all writing different things. It scales, but not as quite as quickly because writes are a bit slower. And then we have shared write. Shared write is the green line. Okay, so the green line starts at sort of not very much there and then goes down and stays completely flat. So I've got linear scalability for both of the reads, for the private write. Shared write is flat. 
This is the most important graph ever in concurrency because this does not scale. Zero scalability. Oh, have I got your attention? Right. Now, why? Well, the reason is this. I have cores. I have caches. Modern machines are very good vertically. They do that read and write thing. They're designed to do that one. They're not very good at sideways. If I try to do vertical stuff, well, I get a cache miss, and I get 100 cycles, well, 300 cycles, and it comes up here, comes into my core, then it sits in my L1 cache. That's great. I can carry reading that one. If you read something else, different cache line, that's fine. Even if we're reading the same thing, it's the same cache line in two places. We can carry on reading it. Great. If you're writing different things, you write that cache line, I write this cache line, fine. They go back and they dribble away back into memory. That's fine. What happens if we try to write the same location or the same cache line? I'm not going to go into false sharing, but if you know what that is, what happens when you get false sharing? The problem is that these now have to talk. So these caches have to go, oh, sorry, I can, it's mine now. Oh, no, can I have it, please? Yes. And we have this protocol called the MESI protocol that moves it one at a time. And this is why there's zero scalability. It's not like there's some scalability. It's zero because only one core at a time can have that cache line. It's like, like zero scalability. So do not <laughs> avoid shared rights. And this goes for the same thing, even when you're dealing with across databases, everything else. Shared rights are the problem. They don't scale. So I've got six questions. Six questions about data. When you're thinking about data and how to structure your system, here are six axes or things to ask yourself to try and guide yourself about where to go. So I'm going to go through these individually. They're strongly related to the operational profile. The operational profile is what, is the, what operations am I doing? Am I doing lots of this, lots of that, lots of the other? Work out what it is that you're doing lots of, and then use these to guide you as to how to design that system, or certainly the data side of your system. Primary key access. This is the easy one. This is the simple one. You can do this all the time. This is like main memory. I've got an address. That's fine. If you've got a NoSQL database or even an ordinary database, primary key access, I'll have that one. Thank you very much. Even if, it's a, if you're using a map uh, or something or a dictionary, whatever you call it in your language, it is, I'm going to look it up by this key. That's great. You could use hashing, order one. You could use something like a binary search, order log n, or linear search for n. If it's small, it doesn't particularly matter. Yeah, that's up to you to decide which of those you want and how, and how big n is. If n is like 10, you might as well do linear search. It only requires a quality, a quality checking. Things like NoSQL databases only allow you, well, a number of them will only allow you to do equality checking on your primary key. You can partition on primary key. Now, they don't have it at this conference, but you may go to a conference that says, right, everybody whose name starts with A to L goes over here. Everybody who goes M to Z, you check in over there. You've done a primary key, nice partition, two things, perfect scalability. No interaction. Good. So split them up and avoid the contention. This is very common. It's very useful. Where examples of this one? A product catalog. You have, here's a product number. Can I have a whole pile of information about that product, please? Great. Doesn't interact with any other product. There's no ordering of products. It's just a product code. Pick it up. Great. Lots of stuff. That works well. Customer records will often do this one because you seriously don't want most customer records to interact with most other customers. That's a big no-no, unless you do, of course. Web sessions. If you've got if you're a web program, you have a sticky web session, you say, well, OK, I want to have that one over here. I don't want anybody else looking at this one. It's always going to be there. I've got a cookie. It's over there. Pull it out of memcache. That's great. No SQL, as I mentioned, does this one. Memcache, you look it up by key. Memcache doesn't even allow you to iterate keys. It's only primary key. And that's first. REST. Ah, REST is primary key. Because it's, you have you know, slash resource slash one, and it's picked up by primary key normally. That's fine. That's probably your go first go-to. Second one, non-primary key access. What do you do, or how often, or how much, and in how do you need to pick things up that when you're not using the primary key? You're essentially trying to say, can I look by value rather than by the key? You might need secondary indexes. 
on a, on a database for this. You may need to search on parts of a record, not all of it. So uh, you may need metadata search. I might need some metadata about when things happened, who did what, etc., rather than the primary key. Uh, I may need to go as far as full text search and stick it into Elasticsearch or Solar or something like that, go and find that one. It's substantially more work than primary key access. Primary key access, the World Wide Web, you've got a URL. Go there, primary key access. That's fine. That's nice and fast. Non-primary key access, Google. Guess what? That's quite hard work compared to just publishing by primary key. Also, usually much slower. Can be uh, uh, fast, but it's considerably slower than the uh, primary key. That's fine. Third thing, this is what people forget. So Deep, um, Detlef was talking about executors earlier on and talking about bulk executors. Uh, this is the one that people often forget. Range scans. Do you need ordering amongst items or not? Because it makes a difference. Do you keep these things together? Because if you have ordering, you can keep things together, which means that when you go and get them, you can go, right, I go here and go, yeep, and then I can go and find them all the things I want as one hit. But that costs you ordering, and you need an operator less than. You need to know what ordering is, because it's no longer just a hash key. It's now an ordered key. You may need to think about iterators. You may need to think about uh, cursors and traversal state. How do you know, you know, are you going to page your way through these things? Or are you going to sort of kind of, where's that state going to be? That's part of what you have to, to think about. Seek, then scan. You sort of go, well, I need to go here and then go and, su and suck up all this lot. Hadoop, for instance, big data stuff, says, is predicated on rotating disk. It says, right, I'm going to pay you know, my 10, 15 milliseconds to seek, and then I'm going to pick up 64 megabytes. So like, I'm, you know, sort of half a second or a second to go and pick up that data, but the 10 milliseconds to get there, that's fine, that's 1%. So it is specifically designed on big chunks of data, and the overhead of getting there is small. If you try to do that one at a time, records like that, there's a reason that people with Hadoop don't use relational databases and one at a time queries. So this is dense linear access. This is the fastest form. Can I get all the data I need in one place, close together like that, and pick it all up in one big blob? like that. If you have memory, so inside your machine, you may get prefetched. If you're walking your way through memory like this, the hardware goes, oh, like he's doing that one, and starts shoving the data into the cache before you get there. It can prefetch. You may also get prefetch on some operating systems if you tell them, by the way, I'm accessing this, disk lin this file linearly. So this is bulk access. Aggregate operations. Maybe you need to say, go and do a sum to do something else. People often forget this, and they're very keen to have primary key access. But the trouble with the primary key access is you now get the n plus 1 problem, which is I now need to go and say, here's one query to go and get all of the, uh, um, the IDs that I need, and then I have n queries to go and pick them up one at a time. And they may well be spread around. So don't uh, even get the linear bulk access. So if you're trying to do any form of bulk access through a REST API, at speed, good luck. <coughs> read to write ratio. So how much data have you got that you're reading and how much you're writing? Because this has a significant effect on whether caching helps you or not. If you're doing data logging, then you're going to be doing a lot of writes. And you're probably not going to have much um, advantage out of um, caching. Now, you may cache the metadata. The actual data itself won't be. You're probably going to find that you need to scale your write bandwidth before you scale your read bandwidth. You're going to be starting to be pushed into the partitioning part uh, far sooner if you're doing data logging than if you're saying, oh, I've got a whole pile of documents and a contact management system. So cache write back policies, cache coherency. What about indexing structures? Index structures are really useful for, for read, but if you're doing writing, the index structures, you've got to update those. If you try doing lots of inserts on an SQL database, you end up that has 14 indexes on it. You spend a lot of time writing index structures. So watch out for that read to write ratio. And does caching help? Here's another one. Working set size. How big is that set of data? 
Is it going to fit in your cache or not? How much of that common data is going to fit in your cache? Um, that could be L1, L2, L3 cache. It could be memory as opposed to a disk drive or on a certain machine or on this cluster rather than somewhere else. So there are certain limits. <clears throat> Maybe you can get the indexing structure in memory, but not the actual data itself. And that's typically what a, a relational database will do. The index data tends to be hot because you've got these B trees here rather than the actual data pages themselves. But it depends crucially upon your access patterns and the skew and the distribution of your data. So at the bottom left there, if I'm dealing with some form of news media site, unsurprisingly, most people are looking at today's um, data or recent articles in the last week or so. You go, that's oh, about this much. How many people are looking at things two, five, ten years ago? Very few. You've got this long, you've got this tail thing like that. Ah, that bit, that fits in memory. The rest of that I can do with this with disk. That's a lookup. Now, take exactly the same thing about going to an airport and you have a passport. Right, most people travel once or twice a year. There's lots of passports out there. and Most of the data won't now fit in memory or it's been there for a very long time. So you don't know what's going on. So actually, other than some crew and some frequent flyers, this is mostly flat. You now suddenly find that actually you've got a load of disk I.O. That one is... Over on the left there is dominated by memory. This is dominated by disk. It's the same th operation, which is lookup, but the distribution is very different. Now, this one caught me recently um, because I had built a system that would do some hashing and it had nice even data because all, all the things going in there were supposed to be deduped by the front end and I had a lot, of, a lot of data that was all unique and when I hashed it, I ended up with a lovely, flat, nice, even distribution. <laughs> so I was thinking, yeah, that's going to be great like this. Unfortunately, what happened is that um, my colleagues uh, didn't uh, clear out the CI test system and so what I ended up with 17,000 times the same thing. So instead of having a distribution like this, I had a distribution that went like that, which completely blew out my hashing algorithms and turned basically what was a nice order one hashing algorithm into a linear search. Um, yeah, we, got, we, we fixed it, but uh, it was well, a case where the skew and the distribution of the data totally and utterly ruined the performance of my system. You do need to know this. And it's not just about read and write. Consistency. Relational databases have ACID transactions, usually. So you say, yeah, I need to do this one, a two-phase commit, and I can make all these changes, etc." But that's quite a heavyweight process. It also pretty much forces you into a centralized system. So like, I've got to kind of get to this point because that's where the data is, and we have to agree this, and maybe that's something else. Ideally, you don't want to be certainly, well, actually, really don't want to be doing this across system. You want to be able to get in one place. Intervals locking. Ah, locking. Yes, that's those nice things there. Dave Budenhoff, uh, one of the uh, P-Threads uh, guys, once said, um, I wish we called mutexes bottlenecks, because then people will be less keen on putting them in their program, because it just slows you down. So all those problems are, are going to be there. How often do you need to update your data? Your product catalog. How often do you need to update that? Well, you might need to update the stock level. Uh, that's probably every time you do this one. Um, you might need to update the price, but the fact that it's got its you know, width, height, length, weight, color, how often does that change? And does it really matter? If, you know, we, if there's a hotel website and it's so, oh yes, now we've got free Wi-Fi or whatever, it's like, you know, when does it really matter? I have to have that right now? Can I have a window of unsynchronization and it will arrive there eventually? So eventual consistency is much nicer from a performance point of view. So this is why the world works on batch updates overnight, because actually a lot of data doesn't need to be done immediately. Even if it was transactional data when you made the transaction, when you're analyzing it, you don't need it right now. You don't need real time. So be careful with the use of transactions. They're expensive. You may find that the metadata and the data have very different characteristics. Don't just put them all in the same database and assume that they're going to be the same. So watch out for this one here. Base allows for all sorts of things like decoupling. Right, here's a nice picture. It's not one of mine, it's not one of my clients. 
Right, OK, you've probably all seen pictures like this. Mm -hmm. Yes, this looks remarkably like, well, every other picture you've ever seen of this one here with some big boxes, loads of databases, loads of arrows. What does it tell you? It tells you, uh, I've got some boxes. Um, there's a nice little key on the bottom here. So see this thing at the bottom here? It says, arrows show connections. They do not indicate data flow. I love that. <laughs> it goes, yeah, apparently these things talk. How? I've no idea. I don't know what's going on. I've got some lumps of stuff, and things got to kind of move in and out. And, and is that a push or a pull? Uh, am I reading data? Am I writing data? Um, this is very much a box-centered view. This is there's a kind of IT director. I want a big box, and I want to buy, buy it. I can't see your process here. I can't see whether this thing is queued. Uh, oh, it says soap over there. OK, uh, that's, that's a start. Um, is this asynchronous? I don't know. Uh, do I have any queues in here? What are the transaction boundaries? Um, there are so many questions that, that come up here about design. I look at it, when I see one of these, I kind of glaze over and go, yeah, yeah, some stuff. And it's going to take me a long time to try and work out what that's all about. And you've got some firewalls. Good. I like those. Um, so I often see these diagrams, you know, X and Y like this. I have this arrow. I suggest that these diagrams are almost useless. They don't tell you. What's going on? Is X reading? Is X writing? Or the same at different times? I don't know. If that's a content management system and the other things are sort of kind of data store, well, it may actually be writing at one point and reading some other point. Does it tell you anything? Does it, how does it relate to your business process? How can that match to my requirements? I can't, I can't tell. Who's got the thread of control? Pull or push is really about where the control comes from this. Um, and even when you do, how often does this happen? Uh, and when it does happen, are you pushing all of the data every time? Are you pushing a bit of the data? What happens if this doesn't work? What happens if I'm pushing, it's an incremental update, and I put 10 things in a batch, and one of them fails? None of this is on this diagram. And there are lots and lots and lots of things you need to know. And this doesn't help you. It's fine for a whiteboard, but it's seriously not good documentation. Or it doesn't help you to design systems. Is it asynchronous with fire and forget? Uh, and would it know if there, was an, if there was a problem or not? Or is it a blocking call? Well, let's have a look. There's an inherent difference between full changes and incremental changes. So full changes allow you to reset the state. So you say, OK, you have my database here or whatever I'm doing, or my product catalog. I'm going to write the entire product catalog every night. Just wipe the whole thing out. If you want to think sort of kind of blue-green deployment, it's that kind of stuff. You can do it in one big transaction. You can say, right, I verified this thing here. It's got everything in one place, and move it there. Ka-chunk. That works very nicely from a point of view of knowing what you've got in it. It also gets away from this thing about, right, okay, if I do incremental updates, and I'm trying to push incremental updates to multiple machines in multiple areas. Who got the answer or not? Push systems are inherently less reliable than pull-based systems. So pull-based systems, the biggest systems we have in the world, the World Wide Web and DNS, they're pull-based systems. You go and pull answers. The only big push-based push system we have is email. Did you get the email? Yeah. I sent one yesterday, and somebody didn't get it. One of the nice things about full changes is they stop this kind of divergence. It says, here's the whole thing. You either get all of it or none of it. You can check some it and say, I've got all of it. That's a, a nice big chunk, big check sum on the bottom, all of it or none of it. It's one transaction. We've aligned our failure boundaries. Yeah, that's kind of good. It avoids this sort of kind of build up of areas, uh, built up, build up of errors, where, oh, you weren't online when I sent that one. So I was looking at, at a system where the client deliberately said, look, you know, I want this one here. When somebody goes in this database here, they need to get to be everywhere immediately. And I went, hold on, hold on. Look, now, we need to do this one here. And then it needs to go to all these people, et cetera. And I negotiated a, an eventual consistency with this one. I said, look, can we have at least an hour, please? End up at 24 hours because of the whole propagation, rather than immediate. 
because this then gave me the ability to be able to do a full change. Rather than an incremental change across multiple machines in multiple data centers, and how would I know that all the machines have got the same thing? I'd like to be able to say, right, deploy all of them, and I can work out it's either version 23 or 24, but it's not 23 and a half, and give inconsistent results. But it's slow. You've got these longer latencies, so you're trading off a time frame against the immediacy. So correctness, consistency, immediacy, these are not obvious trade-offs, and it's not just about, yeah, I can read and write that and just have a, a REST interface. What do you do about partial failure, this thing about did that get the message or not? Incremental change is fast, but you don't gain this business about the synchronization or the guarantees on that one. Uh, lost messages, transactionality, et cetera. So here's a, uh, an interesting thing. Some of you may come across this thing called the Lambda architecture. Anybody heard of Lambda architecture? OK, so this is something that comes uh, from the big data world. And it says, right, OK, we're actually going to try and combine these two things. We said full versus incremental. Yeah, we kind of like one part of this one. We like the other bits of this one. How do we combine these two things into one and make it work? And that's what the Lambda architecture does. So the Lambda architecture says, right, OK, I've got my new data coming in there. And the top here, I have my batch layer at the top like this, immutable data. It's written once. I write it. That's fine. I can now calculate on that one, do all this stuff. If there's a problem, then I'm and I've miscalculated because I've, I've got the VAT figures wrong or whatever today on this batch. I'll get it right the next time. I can rerun it because I have immutable data. And I would pre-compute all the views I need, so I get these nice batch views. But they are static. They are static views because they're immutable. You can't change any of those ones. And this is what's referred to as the serving layer here, which will take these batch views. But what happens when you have incremental updates? Incremental up updates come the other way through this one. This is not immutable. This is my real-time stuff that comes here. I process that one here, and essentially I now produce increments on top of that one. And when I query it, I go, is it here? And if it's not there, I'll go there. So this is a way of splitting or, or combining these two things of full and incremental into one. Uh, it's an interesting um, notion. Uh, and it's um, maybe you need it, maybe you don't, but it's one worth uh, playing with. So the batch layer does full updates on read-only data. Speed layer is the incremental real-time updates. OK, read and writers. Read and writer in one box. So I have that system at the top there, back to this kind of thing here with this one here. We probably, this thing at the top here, X, may well have something that's doing some reading and something that's doing some writing. And it's talking to the other one like this. It's a very vertical thinking. It's very box-based thinking. But actually, what I find often is that the write is happening in one part and the read is happening somewhere else. In an e-commerce system, I'm writing the catalog, and then I'm reading it somewhere else. My contact management system is writing articles. There's a whole business workflow for getting articles and blogs and blah, blah, blah into my contact management system and then out again. They're quite different. But I'm trying to put them into one box called WordPress or Drupal or Django or whatever I feel like doing. What I prefer to think about is actually a much more horizontal data flow based one that says, I create it there, goes across here like that. These are different people. These are different systems. They have completely different scalability characteristics, failure characteristics, administrative characteristics. Why try and put them in the same box? Way too many systems are in the same box. Way too many systems look like this, because they try and do this in boxes. In big boxes, I can't, see your, I can't see your system anymore. I can't see, sorry, I can see your system. I can't see your process. I can't see your business. I can just see a load of tin and wires and stuff and people being very busy. So there is an inherent data flow in your systems. Let's not bury it. Let's see if we can split this into, into two parts and have the read and write. Separate rules, separate performance, et cetera. And that write from there, it may well be actually reading from somewhere else. This cropped up recently on, an, on a system where um, my colleagues were trying to have one API that would do both. And I went, can we have two APIs, please? Because then I have one API that I can, I can use network security, I can do different rules, I can, and it's much easier to understand what's going on when I have two APIs which do two different things rather than trying to jam it into one. 
What about synchronous versus asynchronous systems? How much queuing and other stuff do you have in your system? Now, ACID transactions, getting those to scale can be quite hard. Um, getting it right, you have you know, failures, you may be causing brittle systems, because everything is synchronous, then actually you're just building a brittle system. I remember one, um, one set of, uh, of requirements that said, yeah, we need you know, this availability. We have nine back-end systems to talk to. They were each 99% availability. They went, okay, so that's 91% availability if they're all synchronous. Whoops. And so they had built this just a big brittle system. And I see way too many people be building brittle systems because they have too many synchronous calls. The other thing is what happens, so over time and against performance like this, if I have synchronous calls like this, I have to handle all of that and then it goes flat like this. And in order to get the response time to be low here, I have to have a very high peak in order to try and shrink the area under the curve to be small like this. It's kind of like this. It's sort of kind of delta functions, uh, Kronecker delta functions for you who... Uh, of a physics or mathematical background. So I end up having to scale for the peak in order to get decent response time. Can I do a small amount of work here and then queue the rest in the background? Don't try and send an email when the client's online. You know, click the button and say, yeah, okay, fine, got you. I've got your stuff, thank you very much, and then I'll queue the email later, rather than trying to do it whilst they're all online. Because otherwise, I end up scaling for peak, having a nice brittle system, and most of the time, it's idle. Whereas something like this, with queuing, I can scale for the average and not the peak. So there are big advantages to doing this one. Obviously, disadvantages, because you get delayed failure and all the other kind of things that come with this one, but it is a different way of looking at this one. It's a way of, can you cover over these, uh, these delayed writes? or cover them up using something like the Lambda architecture, saying, yeah, I'll do my, my um, full and incremental updates otherwise. You may find that if you're doing a lot of reads, which are typically synchronous, you can't use this pattern. So you may have to do things like saying, well, OK, um, I'll have to do this one here, but caching is going to help me here, and also um, metadata stuff. So if you start building systems that have flows of data, Maybe we can put some stuff in between to try and decouple these ones so it's not so brittle. Maybe we can put message queues in between, like, like this. So now we don't need to have this sort of kind of point-to-point -point brittleness. Maybe that's the right approach. I don't know. I can't say whether it is or right because I don't know about the transactionality of what's going on. But a lot of these things, eventually consistent uh, and uh, asynchronous data, can be done this way. And it takes away a lot of the, that... Um, nastiness of scalability. It could be a broadcast as well. What you've done is if you have uh, a messaging system like that, you've essentially put, you've, you've made, um, you've put the reliability needs onto something very simple called a queuing system and taken away from your own. This is, that, this message queue here might be a flat file, which is how a lot of the world works with overnight batch files. Why? Because it works. Because there's nothing Simp nothing much simpler than just a file system. Write a file, read a file. So that's why they do this one. You, however, you get into a problem where you can say, well, maybe I, I've got the problem of, of my reads of this are actually destructive reads. If you read from message queue, you go, I've read this one, fine. Oh, I've crashed. Uh, well, I have to deal with the transactionality. And then I go, well, there was a bug here. Can I go back and read it again? I can't read it again because it's been destroyed because that's the semantics of the, of the queue. So maybe we can use these sort of kind of event store things like uh, Kafka and other, or Amazon Kinesis or the equivalent to that, which is, yeah, I can, I can decide where to read from. Not from, there is no iterator buried inside the queue that's telling me where I can read. I, as the client, get to read from where I want to read, which is nice. So Kafka, Apache Kafka, is a queuing system which is very high performance. It was created by LinkedIn to handle all the events coming through their system. So they've got billions of a day going through this one. Very straightforward uh, to do and has very good performance. So it's worth looking at those kind of things. So let's look at an example from a content management point of view. So instead of this nice vertical system here we have with our content management, I have, I'm trying to serve out data out of Drupal or WordPress or whatever this thing is, uh, and I've got some stuff about editing it instead of this kind of vertical thing, why don't I split it and go 
pull it apart like this and say, well, I got my editing separately from this. Uh, that should, uh, so in this case, the edit here is not exposed to the internet. It's complex. It has um, low volumes because I'm only writing a small number of things if it's, a, if it's something like BBC or whatever. Uh, but there's complexity in that process. Then I store this thing and now I've got a fast, secure, isolated way of serving it, not out of the same box. So let's not jam everything in the same box. Let's see if we can use data flow as a way of separating this and making life simpler for us. Uh, you can use things like content distribution networks at this point. We've, we've got rid of this intertwining of things. And instead of having one mashed up API, we've essentially got two separate ones. So here's a larger example. This is a system that is actually going live in a couple of weeks' time. Um, and it was very de deliberately designed using these principles. I only realized afterwards that I designed it with these principles because it in my head and writing this down was kind of, yeah, here's where I got to, which is, so the consumer registers, so we're pushing some data through there, goes into a database, that's fine, we do all that validation at this point. This is all fairly low volume. This bit in the middle here with the server and the client, that's high volume. So this has got tens of thousands or um, transactions per second in terms of reads. So there's a lot of stuff going on in the middle there. Then all the logging and the analysis. So you'll see some parts of this are synchronous, some parts are asynchronous. It's very deliberate that that bit in the middle with the server and the client there is asynchronous. It's decoupled from the rest of the world. It can carry on going even if the rest of it blows up. Because during um, when we first built this one and did some load tests, guess what? All the logging infrastructure just destroyed itself when we tried to do load testing, um, which is not unusual, but the service carried on going. That was good. So we could carry on serving. Even we couldn't log the things, we'd managed to decouple it and prove that we had decoupled it. It was not a brittle system. So there are deliberate parts of asynchrony here to do this one to keep it apart. And each one of those is essentially a separate service. Also, one of the things about this one is if you start thinking about vertical stuff like this, you go, yeah, I'm thinking about systems and vertical stuff, and yeah, I'll write some data. But what it doesn't get you to think about is, where's that going? Where's it coming from? So one of the questions that came up, OK, we do have our logs. We run our analysis on the logs that are coming off the queue, et cetera. And then, then what? Where does it go? Who's going to read this? Who's going to use the analysis? What do we need to do at that point? How does this fit with the rest of the world? These sort of kind of vertical systems tend to go, yeah, I've got that. Oh, I'm just writing some stuff, and we'll do some log analytics later. When? Who? What? Can I have some requirements, please? This tends to make me think, where am I? Where's it? There's something else. I haven't got all of the system yet. Or there are missing requirements. So these data flow things makes me think in a different way than this vertical thinking. It also meant that we had the discussion about should we have two APIs and one API. These are actually APIs here are quite, quite different. So they're on the left-hand side of that one. That's a one at a time. So the right interface into that is a, is a single one because it's individual consumers. The uh, database out there is a push. It's an asynchronous push, and it's a full update. So basically what happens is dump the entire thing, move it across, ka-chunk. So I've got transactionality on the left. I've then got asynchrony moving out here with a full update, and then I've got incremental updates coming out here. So they're all these different facets in the same system at different points. Have any of you come across CQRS or heard of command query representation separation? Yeah? And people go about this when you go, and it's often mixed up, or people think it means event sourcing. It doesn't. What I want you to understand is what CQRS is and why it is the way it is and why you should think about it. Well, because if I just have a write and a read like this and I have some representation here with one API, I may be writing things in one way but actually wanting to read in another way. And it may be that the representation for the two is not the same. If I have one API, this kind of looks a bit odd because I try to have two representations through one API. So this vertical thinking doesn't help. What would happen if I split it into two and said, right, I have an API for writing this one, and I write it in that representation, and then I have some way of transforming that structure back into the version that I want to read. So now my reading is really simple, my writing is fairly simple, and I've got some transformation I have to do in, in between here. 
This is really the heart of what CQRS is about, for me, anyway. This is more common than you might think. This transformation might be done synchronously or asynchronously. That depends on your need here. So I was going to look at some examples of this to show you that there are these structural transformations. <coughs> Once you see this particular pattern that I'm about to show you, you will see it everywhere. And it's a structural <coughs> issue. And it comes up again and again. And the issue is that well, how you're writing and how you're reading are different. So let's take Twitter as an example. So you're tweeting like this. So, you, so somebody uh, has a tweet, they have a bunch of followers. So when you write this tweet, then it needs to go into the output queue of a number of people following you. OK, so what we've got, we have the same thing here. So we have row and column stuff. So if you're in games, this is structure of arrays versus array of structs, because you may be writing your data in one way, but trying to read it in columns. If you're doing matrix multiplication, row and column. Ah, oh, it's that kind of stuff thing again. OK, so how do we, when do we do this one? In the case of Twitter, they started off trying to do one version, and then they changed it. And now, actually, they've got a mixed version. So when uh, some small person who's only got a couple of followers writes something, oh, yeah, OK, you've written here. I'll write it to the output queue of those 10 people following you. That's fine. So what you've got is one representation, it says, which is based around rows and one based around columns. When Donald Trump does this, or Lady Gaga, or somebody who's got millions of followers, what would that mean? That would mean, OK, right, I tweet like this. You then have to wait for the million people's output queue if you do it synchronously. That's quite a lot of processing. And what, do you, what have you just done at that point? Well, you've kind of done something back to this, because you said, look, look, <laughs> let's do a nice synchronous thing here. Let's batch all this one up, and let's do all this work up ahead, rather than doing it on demand. So what, happened, what actually um, I believe that Twitter do is that for their popular uh, tweeters, they do it on pull. So you're, it doesn't go into your output queue if you're following Donald Trump uh, until you start to pull it. Because then they can spread out the reads over time, because not everybody's reading it all at the same time. Not everybody's a Washington journalist. Um, so they have a choice about doing this one. They have a different row and column stuff. You may have to do this yourself. There are also systems that do this internally. Things like log-structured merge um, databases. HBase will do this one, uh, RocksDB. So HBase, for instance, will build things up in memory. So it builds up a nice chunk of stuff and then says, OK, now I'll then take and it sorts it in the output format in memory for the chunk of stuff that you've just done and then merges it with everything that's on disk and then sort of kind of builds these ones up and does a merge sort to, to sort that out. But it doesn't, so it's essentially an asynchronous merge, but it does a sort of kind of lambda architecture in the sense it has fixed data on disk, and it then has an in-memory one and merges the two together when you do a query. So you don't see that asynchronous happening behind. RocksDB does something similar. If you have time series databases, you'll have the same kind of thing. I had a, um, a client that was um, having real problems they said, yeah, we can write data really quickly, but reading it's really slowly. I said, OK, let's have a look. So they would write at time T1, they'd write channel 1, channel 2, channel 3, and they got 100,000 channels like this. And then the next time slice, they'd have another 100,000 channels and another 100,000 channels. Oh, that's really nice when you want to be able to write because you're write, writing linearly. Great. What happens when you want to read one channel? OK, that's channel 1, time 1, channel 1, time 2, channel 1, time 3. And each one is 3.2 megabytes apart on the disk, which means that every single point, the four bytes they were picking up, was a disk seek. And this is why they were timing out. And this is the problem. What they needed was a system that did something like this. What they needed was the ability to write in one way and then have an asynchronous transformation into a read database uh, representation that would make reading fast. Because they said, oh, we can do that. And I said, OK, so you can write it. You think you can't just write in rows and read in columns. That's going to be slow. If you try to write in columns and read in rows, same problem, but just you know, turned on 90 degrees. You can't do this with a relational database without changing the representation. And once you see this problem and this structural thing about rows and columns, it just keeps coming back. It's all the time. It's also one of the things if you say, well, OK, in terms of my primary key partitioning, it means that there isn't a primary key partition that works well for you here. You have to change it from one to the other. 
Columnar Analytics Databases, Redshift, BigQuery do this kind of thing. Uh, so uh, Event Sourcing does this one. It's really quite common. So it takes on, you know, on to the next um, bit of stuff, which is about state and state management. Reading and writing data doesn't help me focus about where is the state in my system. I'm then building a system which has state in memory. Is it all on disk? Is it shared between boxes? How do I keep that synchronized? These are some of the issues you have to deal with in a complex system. How do you deal with transactions? How do you deal with this eventual consistency of these are things are different and I have some updates? How do you deal with failure and ma management of those failures? What do you do about availability? How does management of state affect things like your availability and your mean time to repair? How does immutable data help you? So key point, align your transaction boundaries with your failure boundaries, with your aggregate boundaries, and your service boundaries. That's your key way of handling this level of complexity. Sometimes I see this in REST APIs. I have some resource here with a nested resource inside. So for those of you at the back can't see it, resource one, resource A slash one, resource B slash two. And then you start changing with this sort of kind of thing like this. It might be order and then order lines or order events. You're trying to build an aggregate that way. This, this gets to be really horrible because you end up going, well, do I do a read, modify, write? Do I end up using patch to try and do this? REST really doesn't work at this point because your aggregate boundaries are now too big for the type of transaction that you're dealing with. So it gets, you end up with these fragmentation problems if you're not careful. So watch out for how you do those parts. Failures in, um, in distributed systems are also kind of a lot of fun. Um, I remember one, uh, one person getting really annoyed with me uh, at one point because I was apparently spamming him. I'd sent him a, an email with a zip file attachment. And it was about a, it was a couple of megabytes. This was way back when, um, when things were in download, uh, when we were talking about uh, modems and other things. And apparently he kept on getting this every five minutes. Um, and so I sent it once, but he, it just kept, got, it was a re-deliver again and again. And we traced this one down through the ISP because the ISP, my ISP was sending it, but the acknowledge coming back was not acknowledged by the, uh, my ISP. And he went, oh, I better send it again. Oh, I better send it again. Oh, that, I'll, no, I don't believe that acknowledge. Send it again, again, again. We eventually got there, but this was a, just a distributed um, failure. It wasn't because it didn't happen. It was because the acknowledges didn't happen. And you didn't know you, if it fails like this. Did it fail on the forward path or the backward path? Did it happen or not? And you don't know. It gets to be hard to try and understand that as to where this one is. So it is inherently concurrent. And how do you resynchronize? If this system, you have to take it down or go back, how do you make sure that the two ends have the same thing? It gets to be really kind of fun quite quickly. Um, can you make your writes idempotent? Can you have something on your write that says, it's this thing, oh, I've already seen that, and then rely upon the other end to dedupe it? For instance, if you have an interface that says, well, okay, plus equals, plus equals is not idempotent. Setting the value is. Can you have a read, modify, write with an expectation, like a CAS, uh, a compare and set that says, I'll read it from the database. It's version 33. I'll change this one here and put it back, set version 34, where version equals 33. And he goes, oh, it's changed. Ah, right. Can I get that kind of stuff, the transactionality, that conditionality that stops me overwriting, that gives me these kind of failures, or, or, or prevents doing that one? Can I do this one? Repeatable queues like Kafka help you at this point because you say, well, I've written all this lot out and if I need to go back, I've got a record of everything that happened and, and if I didn't get this one because I failed, I can go back to some checkpoint where I know my state was and replay it and it's an immutable trail. Some of the things that you have to, uh, to consider in, this, um, in these ones. We're back to full and incremental updates. This thing keeps coming back. All of these things about full incremental updates, synchronous versus asynchronous, transaction boundaries, they are all the sort of kind of things that I just have to spend my time about and I really should get a real job. Um, just to throw one in, um, state and management of state. 
even when you have just state, it may not be kind of what you think it is, or the management of it can be really rather fun. So here are two models. I don't know if you've come across Bell Lapidula or Bieber. Um, so I know you will have. So Bell Lapidula is the model that basically you know is sort of kind of secret and top secret and those other things. You can say, right, I have private state here, and I can read the public one. That's fine. Um, and so I can, you can write up to me. You can write to the secret thing. Uh, or I can read your one, so I can do the pull-up that way. That's great, because I'm never going to let this private information go down. This is, however, diametrically the opposite of what you want in other systems. So if I have a system that is like a railway system, and I have a trusted signaling system that's, mission, that's safety critical like this, and then I have a display board for the departures, what I don't want is the, dis the departure board to be able to write into the signaling system. But I'm quite happy for it to read that to, sh to show where the trains are. They are opposite. You can't have both. The one on the left is about confidentiality. The one on the right is about integrity. Take your pick. You can't have both. Immutability. Immutability is very useful. Um, the system that I um, showed you way back here, this one, actually uses immutable data. So that I export from the database into this serving thing, it is completely immutable. And in, one of the things I really wanted, and which is why I was agreeing with the client about having an eventually consistent system rather than have a transactional system, it means that every hour I can put out a completely immutable version that just stays there and does not change. It means I can spread it across multiple systems. And the next hour, here's the whole new thing again. I don't have to do any failure management. I don't have to worry about that one. And that was very specifically designed to do that. Uh, so that, um, because I had immutable data. It makes reasoning much easier. You know what you've got. There's a term that on here as well that is a kind of fun, Russian doll caching. Um, that's what uh, people in the Rails community uh, look at. Uh, MVCC can be similar to this one, which is, right, I've got an aggregate that's got, I've got a project and I've got some things inside a project and I've got comments on that thing inside a project, some resource or whatever. If I change one of these things here, well, what I need to do is to say, I'm going to cache all the other ones, I'll reinvalidate that one and validate its parent all the way back. But then when I try to rebuild this one here, it goes, well, 90% of that's the same. I'll have this one, but I'll use that and this one here. So you can actually cache lots of stuff and 90% of your stuff or, how, or some fraction that doesn't change. And the way of doing that one is actually to change the key, not the value. Any of you who've ever seen stuff on, a, on URLs, you go, yeah, I've got this URL question mark version number and you put a hash or something afterwards, that then allows you to say, well, OK, I can now cache that particular version immutably forever, and it'll just expire, because then when I roll out my new home page, people are using, they'll stop using that version, and eventually it'll just get pushed out of the cache, because nobody's using it anymore. And by doing that one, you've got rid of an awful lot of stuff about transactionality and cache coherence by changing the key, not the value. It's a different way of thinking, but Functional programming does this one, so persistent data structures, as they're called, like that one. Um, it also gets down to the level of infrastructure, pets versus cattle. Uh, this is um, something that's used in the DevOps world. I don't know how many of you have come across this one. Pets versus cattle. So you, the, the computer you're using, your server, maybe you have it as a pet. We used to think of servers as pets. We gave them names. We looked after them. We upgraded them. We sort of kind of went through this thing. And this server's been running for about three or four years. And we've done all this one. And it's good. But recreating it? You've, you've loved it. It's lovely and cared. No, not anymore. Right. We're now cattle, which is we're just bang, shoot it. I don't care. I'll have a new server. We're in the cloud. We'll just start up a new VM. We'll start up a new thing, whatever. I don't care. Bang. And you just recreate it. So guess what? That's a... And it kind of like we've got this incremental change, and I've got this path of somehow I've got here as opposed to a full update every time. And the system that I was talking about there with the immutable data has immutable infrastructure as well. It makes reasoning about things like security much easier. You go, here was the policies. When it got created like that, it got created this one, we checked it all out, and it's not going to change. So it doesn't do that one. I'll do a full blue green deployment. I'll leave all that lot. I'll start up a whole new thing, it's the next version like that, and then just go switch it across. Oh, it didn't work, switch it back again. Nice transactional stuff. So there's a question about, there's a point about having immutable infrastructure. So the thing I showed you had immutable infrastructure and immutable data. 
SSA, single static assignment. Compilers do this one. If you look at the way that GCC and Clang do these things, the intermediate code that comes out is no, is actually says the way it's done is every um, variable isn't a variable, it's a value. So what actually comes out of the intermediate language is functional, it's immutable. So it's not like I'm going to have this register and this register, it's actually done as other things and it then lets the optimizer deal with it much better. Lambda architecture, immutable master data with a, uh, a serving layer over the top that has the, the, um, the speed layer on the top to deal with the incrementals. Immutability is a good thing if you can get it. It also then leads us into this thing about availability. So availability systems are important to uh, a number of people and availability is, there's a very simple formula. Mean time to, between failures over mean time between failures plus mean time to repair. So how do we make availability large? Well, we do that by getting MTB off, MTBF up and MTTR down. So mean time to failures, how do you increase the mean time to failure? Well, you use simple stuff, good software practices, you test it, you have hardware failover, reliable, well-known technologies, you don't use flaky stuff, you beat it up, that's fine. We know how to do that. We've done that quite well. Well, some people know how to do that anyway. Um, so that can be the problem, but when you get beyond a certain point, you don't actually gain the advantage because actually it's the MTTR that's causing the problem. Because if you have a complex system, if you have state that's in here, you need to replay transaction logs, you need to say, I need to resynchronize all these things. Last year, I went, I had this strange notion that I might actually go on holiday. And I chose the May bank holiday weekend and I went, I'll travel on the Sunday because everybody else will be traveling on the other days around it. I'll, tra I'll travel in the middle. And that was the day that British Airways decided to blow the entire thing up because somebody went ka with a big circuit breaker. They turned it back on again. They had 200 services they had to start up in a particular order. Their mean time to repair was about two days to get back going. Yeah? Why? Because they had so much state and so much legacy. These days, you want MTTR to be in the minutes or seconds because it's going to hit your availability more than anything else. And how do you do that one? Limit the amount of state, nice simple services that you can just restart. Yeah? You haven't got to deal with synchronizing state across multiple places. Oh, immutability, that'll help you with that. Uh, maybe I can replay stuff. If I do need to replay it, I can replay it off things like <laughs> Kafka and catch up. So these are some of the, uh, the ideas of, of that. Also, how long does it take you to debug the system? If there is a problem, what is the problem? Well, maybe we'll just reboot it and then work out what happened afterwards from the log files. Maybe that's the way to think about it. Anyway, that's sort of kind of enough, really, of that one. Um, I'm saying that read and write are too low level. They don't help you to design systems. They are sort of kind of assembler level of data. And REST is just a sort of kind of version of that one, but popular. Um, they don't help you to think about the larger picture. They don't help you think about the data flows in your system. They don't help you think about state management. They don't help you think about processes. They tend to force you into jamming things into APIs that really should be separate. Um, and so, uh, yes, another bash at uh, REST there, of course. So data flows, push versus pull, synchronous, asynchronous, business uh, processes, state management, much more fruitful ways of thinking about systems. That's the end of that. Thank you very much. <laughs>